I'm Jeff Glor from CBS Saturday Morning. Welcome to The Dish. Today we bop around Boston to visit three restaurants bringing Italian flavors to the hub. We'll meet the unofficial mayor of Boston's Little Italy, who's preserving Italian traditions and fulfilling his late immigrant father's dream of owning a restaurant. Then we meet a renowned chef and author whose love of fine dining started on a first date. But first, we meet Chef Douglas Williams. After gracing kitchens from Southeast Asia to Europe, he settled down in Boston with his restaurant, Mita. Translating to generosity, Mita's portions and hospitality exemplify exactly that. Dana Jacobson visited the Roxbury neighborhood to see for herself. We have gnocchi ketchup pepe, just cheese and butter, uh, lasagna. If Chef Douglas Williams' soup, eyes focaccia, light up at a table. Uh, Pacquery bolognese, roasted chicken over orzo. It's because dishes like these combine and, and his pasto, twin passions. Uh, bucatini al matriciana, spaghetti con pesto. Hospitality. But I want to split the recipe. And teaching. What do you love about making pasta? What do I not love about making <laughs> pasta? I mean, it's like Play-Doh, the sandbox and the kitchen table all in one. And to be able to teach that to someone and to see that spark happen, that is the key. Parmesan, nutmeg, salt, and pepper. Okay. Just gonna add that to the bowl. Williams asked if he could share that spark that with me. All right, so now you just wanna bring it up from the bottom. There you go, okay. just like that, bring it up from the bottom and just fold in gently. By teaching me to make gnocchi, the Aryan doughy Italian dumplings. And you wanna try to just go for a rectangle, something, something that resembles a rectangle. Okay. <laughs> in a matter of minutes, his mission oh, is accomplished. Just like this, lovely, 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 perfect, there we go. This How is so awesome. You just give him a little bounce. Now we're gonna make gnocchi ketchup pepe. Douglas Williams traces his passion for hospitality to his childhood in Atlantic City, where his father worked as a chef and his mother as a waitress on casino floors. He credits a fifth grade teacher for his passion to learn and pass knowledge to others. It was a sense of enlightenment, finding out about Europe and finding out about uh, what Africa may be like. It's just a magical uh, sense of almost euphoria. But as a teenager, the euphoria was tempered by a chronic illness, which unexpectedly turned out to be a gateway to his culinary future. Being diagnosed with Crohn's when I was 16 uh, obviously was an extremely formative time in my life, yeah. not knowing which direction to go. When you're 16, you want to eat pizza and burgers <laughs> with your friends and, and lots not of care, cereal. right? And <laughs> lots of cereal. Once that happened, I immediately grew up and realized that I need to start liking mushrooms. I need to cook eggs perfectly. I need to be open. And that allowed, obviously, the floodgates to open up and, and everything changed for me. After high school, Williams said while he wasn't set up to go to college, he did have something else in mind. I knew I wanted to go to cooking school and immediately start to travel. And in cooking school, I got to visit Vienna, Austria, which completely changed my life. Why? Uh, well, I got to see Europe and see a Michelin star restaurant for the first time. One of my passions is classical music. Okay. And to see a place where Mozart played with no speakers and to feel the reverberations come through your body. I remember crying. I remember feeling overly emotional. And I said, I want to repeat this. With that, Williams began a journey to kitchens around the world, from Southeast Asia to Boston, and then New York, at Chef Paul Liebrandt's Michelin-starred restaurant, Cortone. New York was a dream. It had the busyness that I wanted, it had the bustle. Um, it was very cutthroat. There was no guarantee that I would have a job the next day. If the mistake was made, <laughs> That's if, a, if a sauce was burned, <laughs> right. if I knew I had to be as perfect as I possibly could be. And uh, from there, I knew I wanted Paris next. After a stint at another Michelin-starred restaurant in Paris, Williams returned to Boston, where he broke out on his own with Mida. What is the meaning of the name? So Mida uh, is actually two words in Italian. Um, it's separated by an apostrophe, and that we translated directly to generosity. And that's the pillar that we stand on. That's how we price the food. That's our portion sizes. That's how we greet you. Uh, that's how we pour wine, thankfully. Yay! <laughs> Mita sits right at the busy intersection of Boston's upscale South End and the more blue-collar Roxbury neighborhood. Cheers. 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 From, from afar. From afar. It's earned Williams acclaim as the only black chef owner in Boston fine dining, but he hopes his mostly Roman-style eatery is known for being accessible to anyone who can use a fork. The pasta, the difference of a homemade pasta is everything. It is. Mm. Would you like some of the gnocchi? I would, so of course. Homemade. 
Of go. course. There we go. Thank you. Oh. Give this, me very full. This is why I did not need to eat lunch today. Along with chef and restaurateur, the titles Williams is most proud of are husband and dad. His two boys, not unlike himself at their age, the perfect pupils. Your life as it is now, is this what you as a little boy thought that it would be? Tenfold. This is exactly my dream, um, even more so. Again, I just feel incredibly lucky and fortunate and blessed to uh, be in this position and be cooking food that I love and still ultimately get to teach. How could that not be a dream? Up next, meet the so-called mayor of Boston's Little Italy, whose empire started with a simple sandwich. This is The Dish. Entrepreneur and restaurateur Frank Di Pasquale injects Italian flair into all of his business ventures, which range from bakeries to hotels. His restaurant, Il Panino, started as a simple sandwich shop and grew into much more. Dana Jacobson met him for a bite in Boston's North End. This is our love, this is our passion, this is what we live for, it's just the love of what we do. With a veritable feast before him, Boston restaurateur Frank Di Pasquale speaks from the heart. I wake up, I can't wait to, to see a, a new dish that the chef is making. I can't wait to see the smile on the customer's face as they're sipping their wine or eating the food or saying something nice on the way out. This array of favorite Di Pasquale Ventures dishes includes zucchini pasta with provola parmigiano and reggiano, margarita pizza with hand-crushed tomatoes, gnocchi alla sorrentina, even a signature espresso martini. But Di Pasquale sets his sights on the simple sandwich he says started it all. Homemade uh, prosciutto, the parma, buffalo mozzarella, tomatoes, mine ripe tomatoes, extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of basil. My first restaurant is named under that particular sandwich and we started it as a panino and we turned it into a trattoria which happened in 1987 which is I think about 34 <laughs> years ago. Longer than Long we want time to remember. Ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and here we are today. Di Pasquale's father was the first to dream of building a food business here in the United States bringing his family to Boston from San Giuseppe, Italy. The city's north end quickly became home. This is honestly the greatest neighborhood probably in the country. Why? It's because uh, people make places. Uh, places don't make people. All right, guys. <laughs> and outside of every door, you will see either an owner or a manager greeting you, loving you, hugging you. My father was here all the time, making sure that Naples won the soccer match of the week. And we had espressos here, and he would buy me a little Taroni and, uh, or confetti. And I was always by his side from when I was four years old till the, the day he passed away. Just 15 at the time of his father's death, Di Pasquale says that's when he became the man of the family. After college, he launched his first business, a shoe store. I didn't like the fact that I had to sit there all day long and... <laughs> and size people's feet. <laughs> right. And so, I, so I said, you know something, my, my real passion is food, so let me get started with food. That's when that first North End restaurant, Il Panino, came to be. This uh, started off as a simple sandwich shop. Di Pasquale traces his culinary yearnings to his trips back to Italy. Most of my friends, they be looking at the beautiful girls at the beach, <laughs> but I spent most of my time in kitchens and restaurants because that was my passion, to watch the pizza man, the way he slapped the pizza, how he turned it in the pizza oven, how he crushed the tomatoes by hand. I watched the people make the zucchini pastas, the mothers uh, make the gnocchi. It was a passion, it was love, it was yeah. everything that I always wanted to be. It's those Italian traditions that Di Pasquale has brought to each of his restaurant ventures, like homemade buffalo mozzarella and fresh baked bread. But it's more than just the food. I always wanted to be the best. Um, and I always say it in all my meetings, uh, people don't remember who comes in second. So my stride was to be the very best restaurant that I could be. And I hired the right people to do the right job. You brought chefs over from Italy. I brought chefs over from Italy and a lot of them ended up staying here. A lot of them ended up marrying here. And a lot of them <laughs> ended up never leaving again. And uh, they're still a part of my team. A team that has a huge footprint in that same North End Di Pasquale first wandered in as a child. And in some ways, not much has changed. We start every morning at my coffee shop. We have our espresso or cappuccino, and we talk about last night. We talk about our food. 
Like I said before, this is the greatest community in the country. We help each other with menus. We help each other with buying. We, if someone runs out of a certain product, they could definitely come to my restaurant or I could go to their restaurant. Frank, that seems so rare to me because you are competitors and you're right next door that you would help each other in that way. But competitors uh, bring up our game. So, so we all become a little bit better. The unofficial mayor of the North End, Dee Pasquale would be the one to find the positive spin. He's also the one that, even in tough times, is trying to look ahead. How old are you? Oh, do I have to say? You, you don't if you, if you don't it's, want it's to. It's right? 68. Do you ever Going see, on 55. I was going to say, do you ever see not working at this pace? Uh, I, think I, I, I think with the espresso martinis and, <laughs> and, um, and the espressos that I have every single day, which is usually about five or six of them, um, it keeps me going, and uh, I think I'm going to hit. Uh, I'm going to try to hit that hundred someday. <laughs> also, can I say cheers to that? Cheers. Cheers to that. Cheers. <laughs> and as we toast that future, Dee Pasquale can't help but turn to the past in reflecting upon all of his success. If you could have this meal with anyone, past or present, who would it be? Oh wow, wow! I think I think it would be with my father. I, I think my father, Joseph, I mean, he had the vision to come to America and give us this opportunity. And I'm not going to waste it. Up next, the unexpected way this Boston restaurateur fell in love with the culinary arts. Karen Akonowitz, a James Beard award-winning chef and author of the cookbook Crave, has three restaurants in Boston. Dana Jacobson learned her love for cooking began with a desire to impress a first date. Chef Karen Akunowitz leaves a bit of herself in each dish she creates. It's not necessarily something you see, but it is certainly something you taste. Mm. The spice right away. The sumac. Oh my that God. Citrusy you know, selenic. <gasps> wow. Take her chicken under a brick. This is kind of a culmination of everything I've learned cooking, really taking all of the flavors and the ingredients and technique, kind of putting them all into this dish that I love. Then there's her hand-rolled orichetti. We want them to be rustic. We want them to be imperfect because the best things in life are imperfect, right? Once cooked, Topped with sausage, chili, chickpeas, and broccoli rabe. Oh my gosh, and the orchid This is delicious, spectacular. So when you make this, that is your thumb. Like, somebody put their thumb into every single one that we make. Okay. And we're gonna press down with our thumb, and we're gonna roll this way, making that little ridge around the side. Okay. That's just a bowl of somebody saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's how, that's how I have always <laughs> interpreted it. That love is something diners at Akunowitz's South Boston restaurants have become accustomed to. Not just enjoying the food, but as I found out... Okay, Karen, this is the problem. I'm going to try to eat everything. <laughs> and we, we're on the first thing we're I tasting. I know. Craving it. Her aptly titled cookbook, Crave, features those foods you just can't get enough of. What made you want to put out the recipes? Why not just make everybody have to come here? Because that's that's the leaving yourself a little bit of yourself on the on the plate. This lets me share recipes not just from these restaurants, but from the last 20 years of my culinary career with people all over. Akunowitz shared some favorites from the book with me, along with some dishes just making their mark on restaurant goers, like Bar Volpe's gnocchi with lemon, caviar, and chives. The ricotta gnocchi is like the canvas for the painting. Okay. And you have your lemon and your caviar like you would with any great caviar service. Something creamy, something caviar, lemon, chives. And it is the book because right now I'm like, I want <laughs> another bite. I don't want to not have that second bite. Yeah. Crave is all about going back for that second bite. And whether that's the texture, the flavor, a contrast in, in temperature, there's always something about it that makes you go back. Oh my God. The farro arancini with black truffle topped with orange blossom honey and Parmigiano Reggiano, a perfect example. Right? That's the honey. Mm -hmm. Oh. As is the calamari and shrimp fritti misti, 
We top them with a condiment called Bomba Calabrese, mm. which is spicy, fermented chili That's and so fennel funny. and onions. I have a friend who comes, comes here and eats this dish and he gets one with his meal and then he gets one for dessert. <laughs> and that's my favorite thing that's ever happened. Like, mic drop, I couldn't be happier. Akonowitz says those cravings are often rooted in a memory, which I experienced with dessert, a chocolate hazelnut semifredo with whipped meringue. This is like when my Nutella gelato starts to melt a little bit. Yes. That's what that is. Both and I'm walking in Rome. You are really doing exactly what the intention is. That's what this is. I'm going to say that from now on. It's like giving you walking in Rome vibes. Akonowitz seems to derive as much happiness from watching others eat her creations as we get from devouring them. That emotional connection told in the pages of Crave. The first time you were cooking for mm -hmm. someone. I was trying to get her to go down a date with me. And I said, well, why don't you come over and I'll cook for you. I'll make you dinner. Like and that. she said, yes. And I said, <laughs> I can't cook. Right. <laughs> and I went out and I bought a cookbook and I bought a boatload of ingredients and I made pasta puttanesca. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't know how to cook. Um, but what it ignited for me was a true passion and a love for cooking. And to make a dish for somebody and say, here, I made this for you. She started restaurant work at age 17 in a New Jersey diner, a job she referenced more than two decades later when she took home the James Beard Award for Best Chef Northeast. What is a moment like that like for you to get the praise from the community? You're gonna make me cry. I haven't felt that way in years, wow. And, and it, wow. Wow. <laughs> because it is, it's like, yeah, it's I the mean, ultimate. It is the ultimate, and I say this, nobody ever believes me. My spouse said it to me yesterday. It was never a dream that I had because it felt s like something that was far too unattainable for someone like me. Someone who now has two restaurants to her name is an award-winning chef, author, and mom. She's the most important thing in my life. I cook for her all the time. Sometimes she likes it. May I please present to you? Oh, just please put that spoon anywhere. The staff will get it for you. Sometimes she does not like it and she throws it on the floor. So that's a lesson in humility. No matter how much love you may have put in it. <laughs> Sometimes she does not care. If you could go back and tell the New Jersey diner you oh my something, gosh. is there something you would tell her, advice you would have given her? Keep going, keep going. Because at every corner, somebody has told me that I couldn't do whatever it was I was going to do. At every corner, somebody has told me I wasn't good enough, that will never happen. And you just keep going, even when it feels incredibly hard. And you look for the people that are in your corner and you keep them close. I think you've proven those doubters wrong. <laughs> With this, when I was, you have. When I was told <laughs> that a restaurant in South Boston would never, would never work. Really? Yeah. I think you have two now. I think it's, it's working out. I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news, stream us right here on CBS News 24-7. I'm Jeff Glore. We'll see you next time for another helping of The Dish.